seen that last week. I was like, oh, I better go. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Glad to see everyone here on this beautiful Sunday morning. We don't have snowfall yet or blizzard, so that's always a bonus. <laughs> I'd like to invite you all to stand with us as we open up our worship service this morning. Good morning. Trustfully, that is the posture that we can come and worship. Jesus talked about putting new wine in old sacks and how those sacks would burst and how instead we needed something that is the newness of God, which comes through the Holy Spirit of God that allows us 
to be new containers to contain what God wants to do in our midst. So we, we come here this morning with hopeful hearts, looking to connect with our God, who is our refuge and strength. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, though the mountains may be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though its mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Lord God, we come before you this morning. We worship you, and we just pray that you would help us to put aside the thoughts and concerns of the last week and those of the week that are ahead and just be present here in your presence. Help us to lay ourselves down and just in your midst, listen and look for you. We offer ourselves to you this morning, Lord, as our act of worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning to you who are gathered here and to those of you who are joining us online. And before we go in further in our service, just to invite you to take the opportunity to turn around and greet one another and see who you are worshiping with today. Good morning. Good morning. As you finish up, I would invite you to uh, have a seat and to grab your bulletin. If you're joining with us online, our bulletins can be found at our website, fortmcleodalliancechurch.com. Or for many who uh, maybe can't uh, find them later, you can... Uh, be asked to be added to our email list where our bulletins get sent out earlier in the week to, uh, to our church family to know what's going on in the life of our church. So a couple of things that are going on. Uh, first off, this morning is the restart of our Discovery Land program. So this is our children's ministry program for ages 3 to grade 3. So just prior to the sermon this morning, um, I'm going to invite those kids to come forward. So usually the picture's up and they're dismissed and they go running out to enjoy their time. While well, as we start this season, we want to pray for them and pray for the teachers. Um, and so I'm going to invite the kids to come forward just before the sermon and we're going to pray for them before we, uh, we send them off. Also, this morning's a little bit different with Discovery Land. Uh, it is for ages 3 to grade 3. Um, but this morning, and I, I, I made mention of it a few weeks ago, we've been preaching through the Ten Commandments. This morning we come to the Seventh Commandment, which is you shall not commit adultery. And although the sermon is definitely not an R-rated sermon, I mean, it's probably nothing that the kids haven't heard on, on media or in the schoolyard, it is definitely a PG sermon and it, it is uh, focused towards an adult audience. So. Um, if you decide that kind of, you know, maybe your your uh, child, you're just not sure you want to uh, have certain questions when you get home today, um, if you want to send them, if they're older than grade three and you want to send them to Discovery Land, you are, you are welcome to do that this morning as well. Uh, also in our announcements, the church is looking for uh, uh, somebody to take over our decorating, kind of uh, the, the atmosphere and the environment of our church. Um, Lindsay has done that for many, many years and done a fantastic job, and so now she is looking to hand that over to somebody else. So if you are, uh, uh, you are thinking that, you know what, I would like to be a part of setting the, the atmosphere of our gatherings through our, through our decorating, um, come and talk to myself or, or one of our council members. Uh, we have our, our new council and our new elders board will begin to meet soon and next Sunday I will put the names of all of those in our bulletin. Sharing Hope in Crisis is a seminar that's going to be taking place right here in our church on Saturday, September 30th. It is an all-day event. There is no cost connected to the event, but it is a high quality uh, training on how to walk along somebody that's going through a crisis. So if you haven't signed up for that yet, 
Just encourage you to do so in the bulletin. You'll see register today at, and there's a website there. You just go on there and register that you're coming. Uh, they need a certain number of people that's coming in order to, to uh, host it. So if you've been sitting back going, oh, I'm planning to go, but I haven't signed up yet, we really encourage you to please go online and, and register for that so that uh, we know that you're coming to that. Um, other than that, most other things you can read in yourself, read for yourself, some of our building usage, uh, our youth ministries. I'm hoping to see our youth ministries start up again in October, but that's going to be dependent upon whether we have enough volunteers to do that. So uh, we talked a little bit about that at the annual meeting last week. If this is something that you think, ah, oh, maybe you'd be interested in, even if you couldn't do it every week. Even if I can find enough volunteers to kind of take turns and, and, and to help with it, uh, we would like to be able to do something in that regard. So uh, please come and talk to me at this point. Um, I'm not sure I have enough uh, uh, volunteers to actually make it happen, um, but if you're able to do it even once in a while, come and talk to me and that will help me know uh, what we can do and how often we can do it and when we can start. We also, November 17th to 19th, there is a um, youth retreat for grades 9 to 12 that's taking place at Southern Alberta Bible Camp. Uh, if you have youth that are interested in taking part of that, please contact the church office or let me know. At this point, I've got three that have indicated they have interest. If there's only three, I'm going to end up encouraging the parents just to to register the youth themselves and to take them there themselves. But if we get a few more that are interested in going, then we will, we will do it as a youth event and uh, send some chaperones and to, to spend a weekend with the youth there as well. So if that's something you have youth in that age bracket that uh, are interested in coming, uh, please let me know. If I don't hear from you, then obviously the event as far as a church youth event won't be able to take place. So. Those are our announcements. Uh, one of the ways that we worship God is through giving out of what God has given back to us. So it is not, uh, we don't come to church to pay for service. Uh, God doesn't need our money. God is able to do whatever he wants to do, however he wants to do it. But he invites us through how he has blessed us materially to, to worship him through giving. And he uses that through the work that he wants to do through our church in our area. So this morning, our, as our ushers come forward, I know some of you do giving online. Uh, some of you here may be visitors this morning. Uh, if you are, please just feel comfortable letting it go by. Uh, this is an opportunity for those who call this their home church uh, to, to share in the ministry uh, through, through the worship of giving. So at this time, we will turn our service back over to our music team.
undone by who you are. My desire is to know you deeper.
You may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, verses 1 to 8. Finally, then, brothers, we ask, to ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, as you have received from us how you ought to walk and please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For what, instruct, for what uh, instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of the Lord of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. And as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God is not called for impurity but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man but God, who gave you this, his Holy Spirit to you. Let us pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise your name. To you be the glory and the honor. May your spirit, spirit be evident in our sanctuary this morning. May each of us here be touched in a special way and receive your blessing into our hearts. Lord, we confess that we were sinners and are sinners, and we ask for your forgiveness. Let the Holy Spirit work in our lives and your word that we read in the scriptures a guide to us in all that we do. Lord, we, want, we ask again for your healing hand upon those that are not doing well, physically and emotionally, and those with urges and desires for things that hurt us in the body, mind, and soul. May your eternal medicine and counseling transform us into men and women with a healthy desire to serve you. We once again ask for your blessing of wisdom, wisdom upon our governments, our leaders and decision makers at all levels, federal, provincial, and local. Let us respect those who make those decisions, even though we may not think we think they are frivolous or harsh. Lord, we pray a special blessing on Pastor Kevin and his family. May his words be those we need to hear and will feed us and nourish us our souls. We also ask for your hand upon our ministry leaders and the many volunteers that make things happen in our church. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
I'm going to invite the kids that are going to be going off to Discovery Land if they would just come and join me at the front for a few minutes. Oh, wrong direction. Come on up this way, guys. Hi. Oh, you guys can just have a seat wherever here. You bet. I'd sit with you on the floor too, but it's so far down I'm not sure I'd get back up. Something happens when you get older. I am so happy to see you guys, and I am so happy that Discovery Land is starting up again. Do you know, some of you know this, it's a secret, so don't tell your parents. You guys are my favorite. They're okay, but you guys are my favorite. And what's more, you guys are the most important people in the church. Does that surprise you? It does, it shouldn't. You're the most, you know, you know why I know that? Because one day, Jesus was t teaching a bunch of big people, like, like your parents and all the people here. Okay, One day, Jesus was teaching them, and there were some kids there, and I don't know if maybe the kids were being a bit noisy or stuff, or playing around, or, or, or I'm not sure. But there were some moms that wanted to bring their, their, their kids to Jesus, and they thought, no, oh, this, is, this is serious, this is important time, Jesus is teaching the adults. And, and Jesus said, no, you guys, keep, keep the kids away. And Jesus got upset with the adults. He said, do not keep the little children from coming to me, because such is the kingdom of God. And he wanted the kids, when Jesus was walking around in, on, on, on this planet, he wanted kids to be able just to come to him and know how much he loved them. And the Bible says when the kids came to Jesus, he blessed them. That's why I know you guys are the most important people in the church, because he was going to stop teaching the adults so that he could spend time with the kids. You are very precious. You are loved by this church. You are loved by your pastor. You are loved by Jesus. And I hope you guys always know that. And as you go off to Discovery Land, I hope that you listen to your teachers. And I hope that you listen for how they want to teach you about Jesus and what it is, not just for Jesus to love you, but how you can love Jesus and learn what it is to follow him. Okay? We're going to pray together. I'm going to ask all the adults if, they're, if they could stand with me. And we're going to pray for you, and then we're going to send you off to your time. Okay? All right. Lord Jesus, I thank you for who you are, and I thank you for your love for children. And I thank you for each one of these children that you have blessed us with within our church and that you have made us responsible to show them something of you. I pray as they go off to Discovery Land, Lord, that each one of these children would know just how precious they are to you 
and how much you love them and how much you want to be a part of their life. I pray for their teachers and those who work with them both today and through this coming season. I pray that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit, that you would give them joy and energy and love and creativity as they, as they work with these kids. Thank you so much for them, Lord. And I pray that you would bless them as well. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You're going to be eight? I don't even think I can remember what eight looked like. Okay, you guys can head off to Discovery Land. I remember a number of years back reading a book on, on preaching, on you know, different ways on how to preach, and I remember the, uh, the author saying he never got upset when children were noisy and doing different stuff in church. He said, if I'm not interesting enough to keep the kids' attention, that's my problem, not theirs. And I thought, wow, that is a high bar to hold, but uh, I think there's something to that. Also, thank you to our music team today for leading us in music and in worship through music. Uh, Alex, do you remember when you were the youngest person up here? He was the oldest person up here today. Thank you for providing leadership for our music team and all, all, all your work with, with that as well. As we begin looking at God's Word this morning, I want to take a look. I'm going to read a second scripture passage from... The words of Jesus from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and I'm reading from Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 37. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is a footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Let's pray. Lord God, as we look at your word this morning, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would uh, bring clarity to the words that are given. And where my words lack clarity, may you bring clarity. We pray, Lord, as we worship you through many ways, we now worship you through the offering of these words in preaching, but also the offering of our ears and our heart in listening. Lord, it is not my words that matter. It is your words that matter and how your spirit chooses to speak to us. And we want to open ourselves to that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are continuing on this morning with the Ten Commandments. We've been looking at the Ten Commandments through this summer season, and we're just about at an end. Uh, I've got three more commandments to cover in two sermons. So we're going to kind of squish the last ones, maybe, maybe just a little bit. As we get into October, uh, there's five Sundays in October, so starting in the second Sunday of October, we're going to be looking at a theme of of really a month of Christian unity, and we're going to, I'll explain a little bit more about that next Sunday, but we're going to be looking at some of the aspects of how the Bible teaches us to develop unity and develop connection in our relationship with one another. But until then, we've got uh, a, a few more sermons as we look at finishing off the Ten Commandments, and This morning, as I said, we are on the seventh commandment. The seventh commandment says, you shall not commit adultery. Now, straightforward, this is a sermon 
about a biblical view of sex and sexual expression. And it's been a challenging sermon to prepare. I've actually rewritten large portions of it at three times to this point. Not so much trying to figure out what to say, but what not to say. Because there are so many different directions that, that this commandment can take us. I have to be honest, it's not a sermon I would naturally uh, pick to preach, although I have preached on, on, on this topic numerous times through 25 years of, of pastoring. Um, but faithfulness to the biblical text requires that we do not skip around just because something might either feel a little bit uncomfortable to hear or a little bit challenging to preach. And as the seventh commandment follows the sixth commandment, which follows the fifth commandment, uh, we need to look at all of what God has said and how it applies to us. And when topics come up naturally in the preaching and teaching of God's word, we need to look at what God has to say of the matter. And perhaps that's in part the answer to my next question in opening this sermon this morning. Because as I thought about it, like, what are, what are those common questions? What are the common responses to, to this kind of message? And one of them would really be the question, what business does God have in my bedroom? What business does God have in my bedroom? I mean, sex is a personal matter, isn't it? I mean, even though it seems splashed publicly everywhere you look, we, we, we think about it as a personal matter. So the who, the how, the what's okay, the what's not okay, what does that have to do with God? I mean, what business does God have in my bedroom? Well, the answer to that is this. If you are a Christian this morning, if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, the word of God is spoken largely to, to us first. If one is a follower of Jesus Christ, a disciple, uh, one, one who has asked Jesus to be their Lord and Savior, the question that we ask about every topic and every ethic in life is this, has God said anything about it? Has God said anything about this? You see, for Christians who call Jesus Christ their Lord, who are disciples, who have the Holy Spirit of God within them through the work of the cross, through accepting the gift and the grace of the cross, they are now in the process of God changing them. And the word for that, and we're going to see it in a moment, is a word called sanctification, to become more and more like Jesus. And that affects every area of our life. Now, if we're not a follower of Jesus, this probably doesn't apply. And you've, got to, and, and you've got to ask the question, okay, if, if God is in my life, and I want my life to be lived in connection with God, and I want to be a Christian, then what does it look like to let my life be directed by Him? Because we will either take our cues from a secular culture, and you remember the word secular, I've talked about it many times, secular basically is without God. So if you want to have a worldview and if you want to have an approach to, to life without God, then there's a certain approach that you're going to take. But if you want to have a, a, a worldview and approach to life that is with God, then that takes you in a different direction. Our Christian values and ethics are not to be a reflection of the secular or the secular culture, that which is without God that we live weekly in. But rather, it is to be a reflection. Our ethics and our character are to be a reflection of God's ethics and character. Who we are called to become more and more like. We are called to live out of a reflection of God's character and His creative designs. Jesus' instruction to the church with a great commission was that we would go into the world to make disciples, that we would lead people through our witness, through our experience of our own relationship with Jesus, that it would attract people to say, well, I want what they have. And they would become followers of Jesus Christ. We go into the world to make disciples. And then Jesus said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. And the reason Jesus said that was baptizing is about identity and identification. And that is so important when it comes to this whole, this whole issue. We live in a culture in which identity is based upon sexuality. 
is the primary place in which many people today look for a sense of identity. In Christ, identity comes from being in Christ first. And everything revolves around what it is to be in Christ. That is my primary identity. And that's a very different script than what we have within the secular world. Go into the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded them. And so what business does God have in my bedroom? If I am a Christian, I look and I ask the question, has God spoken something into this? Now, if any area in life God hasn't spoken into, then do what seems well to you. Do what seems wise. But if God has spoken, then as a Christian, I need to seek to understand what he has said and why, and then wrestle with the question of, will I do it his way, or will I do it my own way? So we are in the seventh commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. Very simply, very clear, clear, clearly stated, you shall not commit adultery. Now, at face value, this is pretty straightforward. And a straightforward focus is on two areas that are touched in this verse. One is sex, and the other is marriage. Adultery is a very specific word in the Scripture. It is not the only word related to, to sexuality in the Scripture, but in this context, it is related to marriage. Adultery has to do with sexual unfaithfulness, physical intimacy with someone who is not my husband or my wife. And at, and at its heart, this commandment violates a trust. It violates an exclusivity. That it really, it has the seventh commandment connected with the first commandment. And you remember when we preached at the very beginning of this series, we looked at the first commandment, you shall have no other God before me. And we talked about idolatry with an I. And that's what happens when, when something else intrudes upon our exclusive relationship with God. Well, adultery with an A in the seventh commandment is when something and someone else excludes or, or enters into and violates the exclusive relationship that we are to have with our husband or our wife. In many respects, this commandment and what God is calling to in faithfulness and marriage is meant to be a reflection of something within the relationship that we have with God. Now understand, men and women can have friendships. I worked in healthcare for 17 years. I used to often tease that I was a visible minority as a male working within the healthcare system. Most of my co-workers were female. As a pastor, I've had many acquaintances, and I've had friendships with people that were of the opposite sex. But there is a relationship that goes deeper. And God has designed for a certain exclusivity that excludes others at a deeper level, a relationship that is intended to be enjoyed but also guarded and protected. And it's a certain relationship where there is a relational and emotional and physical connection that belongs solely to between a husband and a wife. And it reflects the words that Jesus said when he was quoting, quoting Genesis, saying that a man will leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. It is a heart intimacy that is expressed physically. Now understand, intimacy is about much more than sex. Intimacy is about much more than sex. But it is a physical expression of something that is much deeper. And as such, when we look at the scripture as a whole, it reflects and it communicates something of the longing and depth that is intended to be part of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 5, the, it, I'm not going to get into it, but there's a whole teaching on the relationship between Christ and the church, of which 
The Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul uses the marriage relationship to, to flesh out what that looks like. Understand, God isn't against desire. The issue is with misplaced desire. Exodus chapter 20 verse 14 is about sexual sin that violates the expression of faithfulness in marriage. And so as such, there are some areas of sexual sin that I will need to address this morning. That said, I do want us to leave here with a greater understanding of what God is for and what the church is for rather than what it is against. Contrary to the script of the world, sexual intimacy was God's idea and God's design. It was part of what he declared in his creation was very good in the beginning. The narrative that physical intimacy is dirty, bad, stay away from it, this is a false script that has often been communicated within church circles that is inconsistent with the Bible. There's actually a whole poetic book in the Old Testament that celebrates marital intimacy. This was God's design, God's gift, God's idea. Now before I go further, there's a few caveats regarding marriage and sex that I want to make comment on before I go further. First off is this. Understand that sex is not the be-all and end-all for marriage. Sex is not the be-all and end-all for marriages. It is one part of this exclusive relationship. I remember one Bible college student saying to me once, and talk, as we were talking about this, this issue, he thought that a marriage that didn't have sex as part of it was no longer a marriage, and therefore that was an excuse for justifying divorce. I disagreed with him on many aspects. Although it ought to be a normal and regular part of a healthy marriage, and it can prov even provide a positive sense of connection during some of the rough patches as well, sometimes health or other circumstances mean that that might not be the case in every marriage. And that's okay. That doesn't make the marriage less or less intimate. So my first caveat would be this, don't make, too, don't make too much about sex in marriage, but don't dismiss its importance either. Another caveat that I would say as I enter into this sermon is this, marriage is not for everyone. Marriage is not for everyone, or for everyone for all time. Singleness is not the second best. Singleness is not second best. We do not need a husband or wife in order to have completeness. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 in the New Testament actually speaks about some of the advantages that come with singleness. Despite the messaging in our secular culture, singleness and celibacy are not second best. But for some it becomes an actual advantage in living out God's call in their lives. I remember even, I mean, what is it, 34 years now? I don't know, after a while you could begin to lose track. I think it was 34 years ago we got married. I remember some of the discussions as we were, as we were talking about getting married, and, and a large part of it was this, that reflects to me the purpose of marriage. Answering the question as a Christian, believing that I could better live out God's purposes in my life, married to this other person, than I could without. See, we take a look at marriage from a very secular point of view. We take a look at marriage from, I need this to be happy. I'm looking for someone to complete me, to make me happy. Within God's economy, when we look at marriage, we look at marriage to say, God, living life together in unity with this person, does this allow me to bring more glory to you? and to better fulfill your purposes in my life and in this world than we ever could if we were apart. And because of what we believed about that, we decided that marriage was the direction that God would have for us. Now in the Bible are two, two sexual sins. 
The first I've mentioned, adultery. The New Testament, there's a very specific Greek word for that. I'm not going to try to pronounce it because I'll mispronounce it. But when Jesus talks about adultery, it's a very specific word and it relates to marriage. Another word that's used is more generic word that's used often in the New Testament. And it's translated as sexual immorality. And the Greek word is pornonia. And there probably should be some recognition with that word. It's the word that we get pornography out of. And pornonia, translated as sexual morality, it's a very generic term. It's used in the New Testament. Jesus uses it in places. It was in the scripture reading that was read earlier today by Murray. It's kind of a catch-all phrase for physical, intimate expressions with others that are outside of God's intended design for marriage. So it's not just limited to, uh, the, the, the commandment is not just limited to, this only applies to me once I get married, before that anything goes. The Bible is clear that, that this takes place beforehand. It's been a long while since I've done a youth talk that's on, on sex and dating and such, but I used to, uh, I often would ask the question, can you cheat on your spouse before you get married? There's always that trick question. You're saying, going, okay, how should I answer that? Should I, can I cheat on my spouse before I get married? And my answer to them was, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Because the greatest gift, and I realize in a sexually broken culture, there are not many that are able to offer that gift that day. That, I mean, God can redeem that. And God's grace is greater than our sin. Well, let me tell you, if you are at the front end, entering into relationships, one of the greatest gifts that you can give your future husband or wife is that your eyes, your mind, your heart were for them and them alone. That you don't have to one day be sitting there with comparisons or with the thoughts of somebody else. Now, I realize that in the day that we live in, that seems like, wow, that's far out there. And God can redeem memories. Absolutely. Absolutely. But if you're at the front end, I want to tell you, one of the greatest gifts that you can give a future husband or wife is that your mind and your heart were reserved for them. Sexual immorality is a catch-all phrase that looks at all forms of sexual expression outside God's intended design for marriage. It includes adultery. It includes cohabitation, where we live together with somebody in a not committed relationship of marriage. It includes recreational sex, where it's just about friends with benefits. It includes same-sex intimacy. It includes pornography. All of these things are part of this phrase, sexual immorality. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which we read earlier, began this way. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Now remember, I said what that word means. Sanctification is that you become more and more like Jesus. And then Paul got more specific. He says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. And one of the places that this is going to show up, he's teaching, is that you should abstain from sexual immorality. In view of all the forms of physical, intimate, and sexual expression outside of marriage, he says, sanctification, becoming more and more like Jesus, a work of the Holy Spirit in our life, touches all parts of our lives, including our sexual ethics and practices. Because our identity is now firstly in Christ. And when our identity is in Christ, we begin to move our ethics and behaviors to reflect an identity in Christ, which becomes more important than anything that we might feel in a given moment. Now, a couple background things on 1 Thessalonians 4, where this passage comes from. Understand that this was given to fairly new Christians in Thessalonica. This was a new church plant. These were new believers in Christ. And for those that were new in Christ, they had been come out of the Greco-Roman society that had a wide range of sexual morality and practices. I think that's important to understand because sometimes, particularly if you've grown up in a church environment, sometimes you look around, you go, why are other people doing this or why are other, don't they, shouldn't they know this? 
Don't assume or expect new Christians or even seekers to Christ to bring a biblical understanding of sexual ethics into the church. Don't expect that. Paul is teaching them because it was new to them. And I think that's important for Christians to understand as they're discipling new believers in Christ or talking to those who seek, are seeking God. This isn't something you have to change before you become a Christian. In fact, it's not the church's job to change anybody. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the work of Jesus to bring change. We need to connect people with Jesus, and we need to teach people what Jesus has said. Many times within my ministry in 25 years, I have had couples within my congregation who have been living together outside of marriage. And I've always met with them and had the same conversation. I said, glad you're here. Glad you're coming. Feel welcome. I want you to understand I will never point anything out in your life. But in the regular course of preaching and teaching from God's word, I will come across areas that reflect this. I will not shy away from it because you're sitting there. And I've always been understanding, yep, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Christians need to be taught. New Christians need to be taught. And Paul is teaching them. And this is so important because this is, we live in an area, there is so much brokenness within our sex-saturated culture. Between pornography, recreational sex, experimentation, violence, we need more than religious statements that speak out against stuff. We need to actually lead people and walk with people into healing relationships with Jesus Christ who came to heal all of our brokenness. Okay, I want us to understand the damage of lust. I want us to understand the damage of lust and perhaps with that, that will help us understand why marriage is God's design for sexual intimacy. So Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is teaching. He says, you have heard it said you should not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Like the other commandments that we looked at before, Jesus takes the commandments from the Ten Commandments and goes deeper. And as he goes deeper, we discover that, huh, hmm, I think that I'm not guilty of some of these things. Actually, I, I am. I won't ask for a raise of hands for uh, those of you who have ever uh, experienced lust in their heart towards somebody else that wasn't their husband and wife. Because after that, I would have to ask for a raise of hands for who of you are lying. I want us to understand the damage here. Jesus starts in verse 20, 27, and it's a very interesting passage because, and, and, and there's been books written just on these verses. He starts talking about adultery and lust, and then he goes on to talk about the permanency of marriage with the exception of pornonia, followed by the importance of keeping your word or keeping a vow. It's very interesting, the progression that goes on in Jesus' teaching here. He says in verse 28, he says, But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so when I read that, I thought about, okay, what's my natural question that comes out of that statement? My natural question is this, what's the harm with a little bit of lust? Who's it hurt, really? God, what is the issue with this? What is the harm with a little bit of lust? I mean, a lustful thought towards someone isn't going to hurt anything, is it? And yet Jesus goes on with an extreme example to say, this is a danger, so much so, and he uses, it's called a hyperbole, an exaggeration to prove a point. He is not telling anyone to poke their eye out. He's not telling anyone to cut their hands off. But he's saying, your desire to be separate from things that are sinful, that harm you, need to be such that you're willing to go to extremes to separate yourself from it. Maybe an extreme in some person's case, if this was an issue for me, maybe my TV set should go someplace else. 
This is the kind of thing that he is saying. Okay, what, are the ex- what, what extremes are you willing to go to to protect yourself from something that you may be struggling with? Well, what's the harm with a little bit of lust? The issue is this. Lust is divorced from intimacy and relationship. Lust is divorced from intimacy and relationship as it objectifies another for personal gratification. This is what lust is about. This is what Jesus is getting at here as he is teaching. Because lust is divorced from intimacy and relationship as it objectifies another for personal gratification and in so doing undermines the very purpose of sex and marriage. It undermines the very purpose of sex and marriage. Sex and marriage has to do with intimacy and relationship. Lust objectifies someone or something for personal gratification. And it is separate from any real sense of intimacy and relationship. When one looks at a woman with lustful intent, there is no concept of intimacy or relationship. Rather, they are objectifying that person for personal gratification. Now, some of you might say, oh, well, that's a man issue. That's a male issue. No, it's not. No, it's not. Maybe it tends to be more visual that way, although the statistics of women who are getting caught up in in pornography addiction are alarmingly high these days. Um, Many women have the same lustful intent that comes out of their sexual fantasy books. Those Harlequin romance novels, those books that create relationship and then the steamy scenes that follow. Women that got caught up in those things are doing exactly the same thing because it still revolves around lust. One is visual, one is written. Pastor Michael Moradi, in a book on the Ten Commandments, writes this, Lust is a dehumanizing, depersonalizing drive to indulge a sexual appetite. Lust is ultimately using another person to satisfy one's own sensual hunger. Lust divorces love, spurns care, denies communion, and disregards commitment. This is what's prevalent within our society today. And it turns a gift from God into something that damages. Lust dehumanizes and depersonalizes for self-gratification. It uses another person. It divorces love. It spurns care. It denies communion. And it disregards commitment. See, in our cultural context, churches are, in our cultural context, sex has been turned into an act that is often merely a form of recreation. That's about my experience that is divorced from both committed relationship and deeper intimacy. It's not about care. It's about recreation in so many sense. Some of you will say, oh, but I care about so-and-so. But it has limits, doesn't it? It has limits, doesn't it? It has a back door. Sex apart from commitment undermines its purpose and becomes selfish. Intimacy is an act of openness. Intimacy is an act of openness that creates vulnerability, that asks the question, am I safe for you to see all of me inside and out as I am? Will I be loved? And will I love you in every way when my heart and everything else is completely unveiled? The Bible says that perfect love casts out fear. And that only takes place within the security of a committed relationship. Lust uses rather than expresses a love that is patient and kind, does not envy or boast, is not arrogant or rude, does not insist on its own way, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all all things, endures all things. Now to understand this, we have to go back to God's design. In the garden at creation, God created man and woman. God created man and woman and instituted the first marriage between husband and wife who would complement one another and serve God's purposes together. 
And we read in Genesis, God's original design, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother. This is the public statement. Some of you will make the statement, well, we're married in our heart. We're married in our heart. It doesn't matter that I have a piece of paper or not. God's design, and it may be different, expressed differently in different cultures and in different time periods, but there was a public part to this. A man would leave his father and mother, and in doing so, create a new family unit. This was public. This was part of community and society. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The next verse is interesting. And the man and wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Shortly after this, sin enters the world, where they decide that they could do life their own way outside of God's design. And one of the first things that takes place, one of the first things that takes place when sin enters the world, do you remember what it was? They realized that they were naked, and they began to cover up. God created husband and wife for an intimacy where there was a safety and a security in being known and being seen and being accepted and loved. And when God's designs were ignored in life and sin entered the world, the first thing that came into place was a sense of shame. I need to cover up. I need to protect myself. In the Bible, marriage is always understood as one man and one woman who publicly declare the exclusivity of their relationship and who commit to a permanent exclusive relationship till death do we part. It is the foundation for family, intended to give a safe and secure infrastructure for the bringing of children into the world and raising them to live out God's purposes. Are there other forms of family? Yes, there is. In a broken world we live in, there are other forms of family, but nothing compares to God's original design of a husband and wife who are also a mother and a father that each contribute uniquely to a child's life. Can you develop children outside of that? Absolutely. But nothing beats God's original design design. At the heart of this is a marriage relationship where two people have learned to be naked and unafraid, living with an intimacy, emotional and physical, in being seen and known, accepted and loved by someone who is committed to not going anywhere. And that becomes the infrastructure for family. Can you possibly think of a better design or an environment for the most vulnerable people in our communities to grow up in. But when what was intended for intimacy turned to lust, then sexual expression became a place of dehumanizing self-gratification that undermined its very creative purposes. See, sex was meant to bond husband and wife together. It was meant to bring about a sense of intimacy that satisfies that big need that we all have, that someone sees me for who I am, accepts me for who I am, and they'll still be there. Sex apart from the exclusive committed relationship of marriage will always be more about self and self-protection and self-gratification than it ever will be about sacrificial giving and sacrificial love. Jonathan Grant, an author, an Anglican leader from, the New Ze from New Zealand, writes in a book called Divine Sex, a compelling vision for Christian relationships in a hypersexualized age. He writes this, today between 50 to 70% of American couples are cohabiting before or instead of marrying. What is most startling about the trend of living together outside of marriage is, is it is becoming increasingly popular even though research shows overwhelmingly that cohabiting ultimately undermines relationships, with only one in five cohabiting relationships ending in marriage. Now, someone might hear that quote and respond and say, well, that was proof that we should, right? It proved that it didn't work out, and so we shouldn't get married. 
The reality is, though, that when you live in a relationship and you express yourself sexually in a relationship apart from the commitment of marriage, there is a back door that always undermines the commitment to sacrificial love. To give myself away for the well-being of another, another, because if I'm not getting what I want out of this, eventually I'm out of here. This is the why of the Christian sexual ethic. This is the why of the seventh commandment. Why, why does it matter to God? You shall not commit adultery. Don't undermine the faithfulness intended within God's creative design for both marriage and sex, sexuality. Again, from Jonathan Grant's writing, he said, sin, deciding that you're going to do life including your sexuality, apart from God's design. He said, sin is destructive because it undermines the good God has for us, not because it's forbidden candy that a cruel father keeps under lock and key. What's this commandment about? There's so many more areas, and like I said, I've rewritten this sermon three times. I want to start with the teaching of this, understanding the why. God created husband and wife to be together in this permanent, exclusive relationship so that intimacy, which is far more than just sex, so that intimacy, the place of being wanted, seen, and accepted. You know when you look in your heart the things that you don't like. You know the things that you feel the sense that you need to cover up from, the sense of places where you feel in your heart and life, body, spirit, mind, whatever, where you live with a sense of shame. God's intention in marriage was to be brought together with someone that would see all of that and say, you are loved, you are wanted, and I'm not going anywhere. When I do premarital counseling with couples, I'll finish up with this. When I do premarital counseling with couples, I always say there's three big areas that couples argue about. Whenever I sit down, this is always part of whenever I, every, every marriage that I've done. So the three big areas that couples argue about, money, sex, and in-laws. And get a good night, you'll cover all three. Been there, done that. I always say this to couples as I'm doing premarital counseling. I always encourage couples that if they haven't been waiting till marriage, to start now. If they haven't been waiting till marriage, start now. Because if they do, wait till they get married. It increases the environment of love, trust, and commitment during the inevitable future tough spots. And I always say, one of the reasons, one of the things that studies have shown with this as well is if, if I wasn't willing to honor God before I got married, then what is my confidence that my partner will honor God when we're going through a rough patch later? But if you have the commitment to God and one another in your marriage before you get married to wait, you have a greater degree of trust when you hit the inevitable rough spots later that, okay, they're not looking for somebody else. There is value in waiting and honoring marriage before you get married. I always talk to couples about the dangers of pornography, how allowing lust to enter into marriage always undermines the intimacy that God intends for a husband and wife to experience. Lust always objectifies and uses another rather than seeks meaningful relationship and intimacy. That's what God's purpose for sex was. A connection that builds on meaningful relationship in intimacy, not a recreational activity that objectifies somebody for personal gratification. And I always look at couples... And I read to them a passage from John chapter 12, verse 24 to 25. It applies in so many areas of life. It also applies to our sexuality within our marriage. 
Jesus said this, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant also be. I always read that passage, and I say this. It is when you begin to give rather than take, within the exclusive, committed relationship of marriage that you often find what you're looking for. You know, the best married sex, the best married sex will always be when you are seeking to give the gift of intimacy. The gift of I see you, you are loved, you are wanted, which for both husbands and wives begins long before the bedroom. But the best married sex will always be when you seek to give the gift of intimacy rather than I want something from you and you owe me. Often, when we are willing to sacrifice our wants for the sake of how do I serve another, in the midst of that, we often find the joy that we were looking for. Not why is the church against sex. I don't want you to walk away with that this morning because it never has been. God and the church has never been against sex. But when God's good gifts become distorted by our self-centered, objectifying lusts, pain inevitably follows. It can be healed only by the grace of God. Jesus, who one day saw the adulteress come to her and looked at her and provided grace, but then looked at her and said, go and sin no more. This morning, there are so many other places I could have gone. But perhaps some of these thoughts around the whys of the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery, is a start. The Christian sexual ethic has a reason behind it. God had a purpose and a design. And living within God's purposes and designs always and ultimately leads to the joy that we are looking for. There's so much more I wish I had time for. I understand we live in an era, we live in a day where there are so many sexually traumatized people who have experienced the sin of others. We live in a culture that promotes sexuality as a primary source of identity, when for Christians, our identity is first and foremost in Christ. Being authentic as a Christian is not being authentic to what I feel on any given day, and that changes from day to day. Being authentic as a Christian is being authentic to Christ and my relationship to Christ. And there is also... If I had more time, I'd unwrap how this is not the unforgivable sin. It's not like this is the big sin and these other ones are the little sins. But when we come to Christ and we look to Him for grace, He can heal so much and He can make so much brand new. If you're not a Christian, who cares? Doesn't matter. Right? If you don't claim to be a follower of God, you don't really want Him in your life, do what you want. That's up to you. But if you sit here this morning and you say, you know what? I'm either seeking God because I'm thinking I want Him in my life, or I've declared that I'm a Christian. Then the Bible says your life is not your own. You belong to the one who saved you. And the question will become, do I do it my way? Or even if I don't feel like it sometimes, do I do it God's way? There are many times that we don't feel like doing what God called us to do. But later, we are so glad we did. What would God have you to do with this? Only you can answer that.
please join with me standing once more as we sing of our Father's love, our Heavenly Father's love, which is completely pure and undefiled. Much of what I'm saying is speaking into marriages today. And just because somebody is married doesn't mean that even within their marriage they have actually found the joy of the gift that God intended for those of which he has sought to gift this blessing of sexual expression. Even within marriages we need to learn how to give more and serve more than take. See, blessing always seeks to give. Lust always seeks to use. And whether you're married or not, that still applies. Probably the most difficult part in preaching this sermon is this, is I know that there are some of you who have experienced the misuse of somebody else treating you as an object. And I know that there are some of you maybe all of you, that have one point or another been guilty of treating somebody else as an object for yourself. We have a gracious God. He's not up there looking to wag his finger at you. He's looking at pouring out his grace upon you and bringing healing to your life, to your memories, and bringing something new, but only if you want it. And only if you're willing to say, God, I've done this my way. Now maybe I need to do it your way. And I need to look to you. As a Christian, all of life is lived under Jesus Christ, who said, teaching them to observe all that I have said. And in that, we bring glory to God. 
maybe you need somebody to pray with you or for you today. If you're a lady, find a lady. If you're a man, find a man. But if you need somebody to pray with you or for you today, tap someone on the shoulder and just ask them. That even though this is such a sensitive topic, that even within the church, the family of God, we can look at one another and say, I want to be a blessing and minister God's grace into your life. Knowing that whatever wounds you're experiencing or have experienced, he is enough. Lord God, I pray here for your people as we live, leave here. I pray we leave here knowing that we are going to once again throughout this week to come hear a script on sexuality that is so much different than what we award te word teaches. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be affirmed in the goodness of God and that, Lord, your ways matter because your ways are ways that bring blessing rather than pain. Father, I pray for those of you, for those here who may have been hurt by pain in this area. I pray, Lord, that you would meet with them today. The Lord, first and foremost, our intimacy with you would be one in which we discover that we are seen by you. We are known by you. And we are loved. And you are a God who loves us and invites us to walk with you. Bless your people and keep them, Lord. Make your face shine upon them and be gracious to them. Turn your face towards them and give them peace.